Good afternoon, everyone. I want to welcome you to this year's annual Chase Peace Prize event, celebrating the best senior thesis for, from a student of the college on the topic of war and peace. The Chase Peace Prize was created in 1939 through a request by Edward M. Chase, a New Hampshire furniture magnate and philanthropist. Mr. Chase was a Lithuanian native who emigrated to the United States with his parents at the age of 15. He settled first in Lewiston, Maine, where at age 18 he started his first business as a tea merchant. He subsequently moved to New Hampshire, changed businesses, built up a thriving furniture dealership, and his business successes allowed him to pursue numerous philanthropic endeavors. One concern of his was the elusive quest for world peace. To this end, he established funds at Harvard, Hebrew University, and Dartmouth to encourage the careful reflection on the causes of war and prospects for enduring world peace. Ever the successful businessman, his bequest provided a monetary incentive in the form of the Chase Prize to encourage students of the college to undertake such careful reflection. We are today beneficiaries of Mr. Chase's largesse. The Chase Grant allows us to offer two prizes each year. The first is an annual undergraduate essay contest, open to all undergraduates of Dartmouth College. Students may submit course papers or original essays that explore a pertinent aspect of war and peace. The second, and the reason why we are gathered here today, is the Chase Senior Thesis Contest, offered to the student who pr produces the best senior thesis or project pertaining to the issues of war and peace. In addition to a substantial monetary prize, the winner of the contest is brought back to Dartmouth to participate in an event dedicated to their winning thesis or project. I encourage any students here today to think about entering this year's sets of contests, um, the essay un undergraduate essay contest, which will be um, closed to entrance April 4th, and the senior thesis prize um, submissions, which are due on June 1st. This is a truly special event for us to put on, as it allows us to showcase the fine work our students achieve during their time at Dartmouth. So without let further ado, let us turn to this fine work. Our moderator this afternoon is Professor Alan Stamm. Dr. Stamm is Professor of Government and the coordinator of the War and Peace Studies program um, underwritten by the Dickey Center. He attended Cornell University and received his PhD from the University of Michigan. He is a recipient of the prestigious Carl Deutsch Award for the Best Young Scholar in International Re Relations and of a fellowship at the Center for Advanced Study in Behavioral Sciences at Stanford University. He has written widely on war outcomes, conflict durations, alliance politics, mediation and conflict resolution, and economic sanctions. His books include Win, Lose, or Draw, Democracies at War, and The Behavioral Origins of War. He is, in addition, a NASCAR fan whose presence here today prevents him from watching the qualifying races for the Daytona 500. <laughs> Such professional dedication. <laughs> Professor Stan. Now I'm really embarrassed. <laughs> in fact, the video machine is rolling as I speak. Um, thank you very much for the kind introduction, Chris. Uh, Fortunately, I don't have to introduce myself because when I do, it's one of the things I almost always forget. Um, first off, I'd like to thank the Dickey Center for providing the administrative and essentially logistical support for making this type of event happen. Um, I've now taught at four different universities, although I hopefully this will be my last stop in my somewhat to date peripatetic tour of academia. This is the first place I've ever been that runs an event like this for undergraduates like Joshua. All universities have extraordinary young people attending them doing, in many instances, extraordinary things. It is unfortunately not common that universities recognize in this type of public setting the students that the university judges as the ones doing the best job. Since September 11th of a few years ago, terrorism and attempts to contain or control terrorism have consumed academics, policymakers, and students alike. 
Last year, Joshua wrote an extraordinary essay about thinking about strategies by which a country like the United States could try to, anyways, manage the problem of international terrorism. It gives me great pleasure today to be able to introduce to you Joshua Marcuse. In his senior year, he was an inspiration to me in his leadership of the student group of War and Peace Fellows. This is a group of 15 undergraduates at Dartmouth that we essentially provide lavish resources to, to bring in outside speakers so that they can have a, an early introduction to the world of policymaking in the context of the specialization of their choice. Joshua was one of the select students in this group that really stood out, both in terms of his ability to help organize the other students and it's also in terms of his both intellectual and emotional um, commitment to the projects at hand. Today, Joshua is a research associate in European and National Security Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations. He works for Dr. Charlie Kupchan, assisting him on a book on the sources of stable peace in the international system. He's also assisting with the task force report on post-conflict capabilities, which provides analysis and recommendations from a panel of experts chaired by former Deputy National Security Advisor Brent Scrocoft and former National Security Advisor Sandy Berger. In his spare time, I can assure you, Joshua is not a NASCAR fan. <laughs> Instead, he is starting an organization called Young Professionals in Foreign Policy. This is a membership organization for re recent college graduates just starting their careers in foreign policy. They meet twice a month with ver veteran foreign policy practitioners and experts in the field to discuss current events, international politics, and career opportunities in international affairs. It gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Joshua Marcuse. Thank you very much, Professor Stam, for that very kind um, and flattering introduction. And thank all of you so much for coming, especially my professors and family and friends. Uh, and for four years, I sat in the <laughs> seats that all of you are sitting in, and I had the amazing opportunity provided by Dickey to attend lectures like this. And I have to admit that there were a few occasions, maybe not so few occasions, when I hoped that one day I might be asked back to give a talk such as this. But of course, in my wildest imagination, it was something like 30 to 40 years <laughs> from now. Um, so to be asked back today is really such a privilege and such an honor, surpassed only by the fact that I get to share the stage with two such distinguished Dartmouth alums whose careers I admire so very, very much. Their presence here today is truly an honor to me, and it made the work I did worthwhile. Thank you very much, Tom and Paul, for coming. And thank you to the Dickey Center for all the reasons Professor Stam gave, for making this event possible, to Professor Walforth for organizing it, to Ambassador Yalowitz for all of his help and support over the years. Um, this is truly a remarkable event, which reflects credit on the center and on Dartmouth. Tom and Paul are the real attraction here today, so I'm going to try to keep my remarks as brief as possible so that you can hear from them. And I'm just going to sketch out the main argument of my thesis as best I can, and I look forward to getting the really tough questions from you during the question and answer period. Terrorism is an immensely complex phenomenon, and I recommend Paul's book to any of you if you'd like to understand it better. The piece of the puzzle that I focused on was this aspect of military assistance being used specifically for counterterrorism. Now, what I mean by that is military assistance is the programs run by the Department of Defense for training, funding, and equipping foreign militaries, expressly for the purpose of combating terrorist groups. Now, ostensibly, the logic here is to enhance the military capabilities of our allies to fight terrorist groups on their territory so that we don't have to fight them on our territory. And we have hundreds of troops and billions of dollars each year are devoted to providing military assistance to over 100 countries. Major programs specifically for counterterrorism are active in Colombia and the Philippines, which are the two countries where I focused my research, but also in Yemen, Pakistan, Georgia, throughout Central Asia, and Africa. Given the strength of our military, it makes intuitive sense that this is something that we should do. Indeed, it figures prominently into the administration's national security strategy for combating terrorism. And when most Americans think of the war on terrorism, they naturally think of soldiers. I began writing my thesis as an advocate of this approach, but as my research progressed, I drew some startling conclusions, and in my view, there are some aspects of this strategy which are really quite problematic. 
I want to focus on just three main ideas that will get at the thrust of my argument. And I want to tell you about some of the possible costs and risks that I see if we don't get this strategy right. And if there's time, and Professor Stam is generous, um, I will get into some of my recommendations for an appropriate role for military assistance as a counterterrorism strategy and for the war on terror more broadly. So idea number one, the nature of conventional and unconventional warfare. You can't understand the war on terror unless you understand the meaning of these two terms. Admittedly, I'm about to present a very oversimplified view. When I talk about conventional warfare, I want you to imagine two armies massing on either side of a field. You can imagine them in you know, bright red coats if you want. Um, these two armies shoot at one another until one army surrenders. And basically, this is a contest between two states to determine which is more powerful. When I talk about unconventional warfare, which is in many ways going to be the focus of my remarks, we're talking about the opposite of that. I want you to imagine the horrifying image of the jets crashing into the World Trade Center. In the figurative battle, one side is the world's dominant superpower, us. And on the other side, it isn't even a state. It's 20 guys with box cutters who figured out how to circumvent all of America's military power and strike a devastating blow by exploiting our vulnerabilities. We call this kind of confrontation asymmetrical. Now, these two examples lie at the extremes of a spectrum. Most conflicts fall somewhere in between and often combine elements of both conventional and unconventional warfare. One type of warfare that has been in the news a lot lately falls roughly in the middle of this conflict spectrum, guerrilla warfare, which is what happens when insurgency clashes with counterinsurgency. Insurgencies combine elements of conventional and unconventional warfare, which is one of the reasons why they are such a nasty, nasty business to, to fight. So when a state such as the United States or Germany or Spain, a very powerful state with robust capabilities, faces terrorists such as Al-Qaeda, the terrorists will adopt asymmetrical tactics that make the conventional strength of their opponent irrelevant. They will operate with great secrecy, concealing as much as possible about themselves and their plans, and when they strike, they often strike at unprotected targets. When a state is weaker, such as the states that I studied, Colombia and the Philippines, the sorts of states that need our military support, or like Iraq today, then terrorists use insurgency tactics because they can inflict great harm without the added burden of maintaining as much secrecy and complexity. The terrorists that threaten America the most, at least directly, are the covert types that are planning complex attacks in secrecy. Al-Qaeda is the best known example, but not the only group of that kind. Idea number two, the strength and weaknesses of, excuse me, the strength and weaknesses of military assistance. The United States possesses unparalleled conventional military power. As a result, we are fantastic at providing foreign militaries with training and equipment to increase their conventional strength. We have over 50 years of experience at this. We have very little experience, however, in providing military assistance for counterterrorism. Hence, I wrote my thesis. Unfortunately, it turns out that it's much harder to train foreign militaries in these unconventional capabilities, which are the skills that are most useful for fighting insurgents or covert networks of terrorists. The closer the enemy is on the, to the unconventional war end of the spectrum, the less useful military assistance is going to be. Well, why is this? It's much easier to teach soldiers how to shoot than to teach them how to identify whom to shoot figure out where they are, when they will be there, and how to get to them. Those types of skills require more experience and more sophisticated training and equipment, such as those used by our most elite special forces and case officers. These missions push the limits of our own capabilities, and so naturally they are more difficult to teach to others. From what I've seen, our military trainers and advisors have achieved miracles in improving the professionalism, combat effectiveness, equipment, morale, and human rights practices of militaries all over the world. This is a credit to the men and women of our armed forces, and it's very beneficial to those countries that receive the support. But given the unconventional nature of the counterterrorism mission, the progress doesn't really translate into success that we hoped for. Knowing how, knowing how high to set the bar is tricky, but the programs are not eliminating the terrorist threats to the host countries, nor are they eliminating the threats to the United States. Which brings me to idea number three. Put idea number one together with idea number two, and what do you get? To review, we understand from idea number one that the war on terror is primarily an unconventional war. 
And we understand from idea number two that military assistance is good at conventional capabilities, but much less effective at unconventional capabilities. So what we have here when you combine these ideas is a mismatch. You have a disconnect. The ends and the means of this strategy are improperly linked. And so idea number three is that conventional <laughs> military resources that we are throwing at the problem are not really cutting to the heart of the unconventional terrorist threat that we face. Where we do see some overlap is in the middle of the threat spectrum, where the unconventional and conventional meet. And that's what the guerrilla warfare that I was telling you about. We can train other militaries in counterinsurgency operations, and so we can use military assistance to greater effect when the terrorists are not operating as covert networks of cells, but as the insurgency model. The terrorists we are fighting in the coming in the Philippines and in Iraq today are best categorized as such insurgencies. Now, while that may seem like good news, it's not, because counterinsurgency warfare is about the most brutal, demanding, and some would even say hopeless type of military operation there is. A hundred years ago, a British officer and a pioneer of counterinsurgency tactics, Colonel C.E. Caldwell, described it as like eating soup with a knife. And like a virus, the insurgencies can mutate. I predicted in my thesis that as our military assistance programs made these weak states conventionally stronger, rather than meet the growing conventional challenge with a conventional response, the terrorists will adapt according to the logic of asymmetry. They become less and less like an insurgent and more and more covert. They go underground, making our military assistance increasingly irrelevant. In the past year, what we've seen in Colombia and in the Philippines is a strategic retreat coupled with a rise in urban terrorism and a consolidation of power through alliances between groups and across regions. It's just what I feared. You also have to understand that many of these insurgencies are not directed at the United States, but are often aimed at achieving local or regional objectives. By and large, these insurgencies have ambiguous connections to al-Qaeda or sometimes none at all. So it seems that the provision of military assistance tends to draw the United States into these nasty conflicts where the U.S. is not the primary target and the prospects for success are limited. And that's not even the troubling part. Let's talk about the costs and the risks. What concerns me the most is that there are costs and serious potential risks to this approach that are not really being discussed. And let me run through them as quickly as I can. First, there are direct costs and opportunity costs. These programs consume valuable financial, material, political, and human resources that could be used in other ways in the war on terror, perhaps with greater utility. Second, there are the political costs. This is a very sensitive time for America and international politics, and an increased military presence around the world and military support for some of our less virtuous allies could generate a lot of negative perceptions among foreign governments and with foreign publics. There are domestic political costs, too especially since these programs have been associated in the past with human rights abuses, the subversion of democracies, and a fear of another Vietnam quagmire. Third, American involvement can exacerbate problems on a local and even global scale by escalating violent conflict, stirring nationalist sentiments and anti-American sentiments, boosting recruitment, generating popular support for terrorist causes, and motivating more terrorism. Fourth, and most alarming, there is the potential for this strategy to make the United States less, not more secure, by persuading terrorists that the United States stands between them and their objectives, and that only by attacking us can they succeed. They may make common cause with other groups and move from targeting their governments to targeting us. Perhaps they may take our sol attack our soldiers first. Perhaps they will go after political and financial interests next, or perhaps Americans living abroad, or our allies or next, our embassies. Or maybe, one day, they will decide to take the jihad to our cities and our homes, as they did on September 11th. Now, if this link seems far-fetched, just ask the terrorists why they attacked us on September 11th. Osama bin Laden, in an open letter to the American people written shortly after 9-11, said, Our current battle is the Jews. Muslims find that the American stand is a protective shield and strong supporter, both financially and morally. The desert storm that blew over New York and Washington should, in our view, have blown over Tel Aviv. The American position obliged Muslims to force the Americans out of the arena first to enable them to focus on the Jewish enemy. Israel, of course, is the number one recipient of American military assistance. 
Ayman al-Zawari, leader of Egyptian Islamic Jihad, a group dedicated to the overthrow of the Egyptian government, said to his followers, we need to switch our sights to the far enemy before we can get to the near enemy. Egypt is, of course, the number two recipient of American military assistance. Colombia, ladies and gentlemen, is the th number three recipient of military assistance. Could the FARC one day be provoked into retaliating against us directly? Well, we don't know. They have not yet. But it's possible that the military assistance we are providing today may be the next catastrophic terrorist attack 10 years from now. This alone is not a reason to suspend our military assistance to our allies in the war on terror, but it is a reason to think twice. So I've pointed out a number of ways in which this military assistance strategy is suboptimal. The inevitable first question will be, well, then what should we do? The good news is that there's a lot we can do. And much of it is being done already, and still more of it can be done better. First, we need to reevaluate this policy. It's much too important and too valuable a tool to our counterterrorism arsenal just to scrap it. But we do need to understand the complexity of the issues so we can make wise decisions about when and under what conditions to apply this counterterrorism strategy. Second, we need to tailor the programs for counterterrorism by minimizing the costs, maximizing the benefits, and managing the risks. I have a 10-point plan to optimize the strategy, and this is the gist of it. Stress unconventional capabilities. Special operations are key, and intelligence is everything. Focus on law enforcement skills, such as prevention, protection, detection, investigation, forensics, consequence management, and judicial procedures. Leverage high technology assets and force multipliers, particularly for reconnaissance, mobility, and communications. Avoid dependency by training the trainers, not just the soldiers. This creates essential sustainability in our mission. Train small units well instead of large units poorly, and train from the top to the bottom. Comprehensive institutional reforms of the military of these countries at the strategic planning level is needed to affect permanent change. Maintain the crucial focus on human rights training and minimize the U.S. footprint um, whenever possible. And if you need to U.S. trainers in country, then you want to acquire cultural intelligence and be prepared to embed them necessary, but use extreme caution with Americans on the ground. Consider the public in these countries, not just the enemies. Diplomatic sensitivity is vital, and a hearts and minds approach is crucial. Develop mature, respectful, mutual relationships with our partners, and always, always use a total approach. Military assistance should never be given in isolation. It should always be linked to development, political, and humanitarian reforms. Third. We need to remember that military assistance is but one component of a multifaceted grand strategy for combating terrorists. As I conclude, I want to place these specific recommendations for military assistance strategies into the context of the broader war on terror by offering a few more general recommendations. In the war on terror, the United States needs to focus our capabilities to fight and win the unconventional war, not the conventional wars. This means we'll need to have new roles and new resources for our intelligence agencies, especially for human intelligence collection and strengthening our special operations forces for direct action. We need to prioritize the terrorists that threaten us the most. We cannot stabilize the whole world overnight, so we need to pick our battles and then win them. We need to strengthen even further our cooperation with other governments and our intelligence sharing. We need to improve our interagency process through a Goldwater-Nichols type reform of the intel community, and I'm afraid that a national intelligence director alone is not the answer. We need to go after the financing of these terrorist operations, and we need to develop the laws and legal institutions to meet these new challenges. We need to strengthen our homeland security measures and face the fact that the war on terror requires not only offense, but defense as well. We must use all the policy levers at our disposal, diplomatic, economic, political, cultural, as well as military. And the most important thing that we can do, and I think that goes for everyone in this room as well as the policymakers at the table, the most important thing we can do is understand the, the long-term as well as the short-term components to the war on terror. In the short term, we need to be prepared to fight ruthlessly and tenaciously to kill our enemies before they can kill us. This is an ugly business, and we need to get our hands dirty. But over the long term, that will never, never be enough. America must encourage meaningful reform in the Arab world, especially in Iran and Saudi Arabia. We need to initiate radical change in our energy policy at home. We need to make dramatic progress in the Arab-Israeli conflict. 
We need to manage the WMD proliferation issues vigilantly. And we need to undermine the very roots of terrorism by renewing our commitment to American leadership in promoting peace, justice, prosperity, and greater freedom throughout the world. Thank you very much. Thanks, Josh. That was fantastic. Next, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Tom Callahan. Tom Callahan is Senior Policy Advisor for the Bureau of Diplomatic Security of the United States Department of State. Perhaps more importantly, he is a member of Dartmouth's class of 1984. <clears throat> he received the Barrett Cup for all-round achievement at Dartmouth, then continued on to receive his JD from Yale University Law School. In his professional capacity, he reviews operational, policy and design elements of American training and assistance programs that are offered to foreign security forces in the support of the fight against terrorism. He reports to the Assistant Secretary of Diplomatic Security and is responsible for communicating counterterrorism program object objectives to Congress and other executive branch agencies. Mr. Callahan came to diplomatic security from the Secretary of State's Office of Policy Planning, where he covered African affairs and received a Superior Honor Award. Prior to joining the State Department, Mr. Callahan served in the legislative branch, first on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and later on the House International Relations Committee. He is also director of the International Republican Institute's Democracy and Governance Program in South Africa for two years prior to working in the State Department. He is a member of the Woodrow Wilson Center's Congressional Outreach on Africa Program and several counterterrorism counter working groups. I think it would be hard to imagine to have a more capable policymaker here today to talk about the subject at hand. Please welcome Mr. Callahan. You don't need to uh, try too hard to imagine because I'll, I'll be followed by one in just a few minutes. Um, thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, when professors will take off their watch and they put it down, they want you to think that they're going to look at the time. <laughs> what, what you don't realize is they're putting it face down. Um, so if I get going on two topics that I enjoy discussing, uh, Joshua and counterterrorism, uh, please give me the hook. I'll try to keep, uh, keep my remarks and invite you to, um, we can expand on any themes with uh, questions. First of all, and most importantly, congratulations to Josh. Congratulations to his parents uh, and, uh, and friends. This is an excellent thesis. Um, how many here have had the opportunity to read it? I advise you to get a copy <laughs> while Josh is here and have him sign it <laughs> because it's going to be worth a lot on eBay someday <laughs> uh, as the first published work of uh, the then sure to be famous uh, Joshua Marcuse. I'd like to start um, with a typographical error I found on page 46 <laughs> and proceed through. Well, that's not what we're here for today. Um, but before I begin with a few remarks, um, I'd like to just take a moment to recall the memory of someone who would be so pleased uh, at, at this event, and so pleased at this work in which a, an undergraduate uh, uh, put together a thoughtful, well-researched, and terribly relevant uh, uh, paper relevant to today's current challenges. I'm thinking of David McLaughlin, the president of Dartmouth College who was here when I was here, the man who handed me my diploma, the person who handed me uh, an award on my <coughs> graduation and who was taken from us last year quite suddenly. I met Josh last year uh, when he invited me to uh, speak to the War and Peace Fellows uh, during their boondoggle, I mean study trip to uh, <laughs> Washington, D.C. Um, I agreed even before I found out that it involved an excellent Italian dinner with a few glasses of wine. Um, but what struck me then was, uh, just as the professor alluded to, Josh has not only the um, intellectual capabilities to, to produce an excellent paper uh, and deliver 
um, very insightful remarks, but the organizational and operational capability that's, that, that was apparent from the beginning mm -hmm. between phone calls and emails and adjusting um, flexibly to meet my schedule, um, I realized that this is one of those rare individuals who has, can do both policy and operations at, at an age that, uh, that I'm quite embarrassed uh, to, uh, uh, you know, to, 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 to see that he is, uh, he is there already. <clears throat> it's also uh, disturbing to have to follow a speaker um, uh, as good as Josh, uh, who's 20 years my junior. Um, <clears throat> in the best liberal arts tradition, Josh tackles in his thesis uh, with fresh eyes some questions that have been afflicting and challenging statesmen and military strategists for quite a few years. Uh, one of them, Sun Tzu, about 2,400 years ago, said that one need not, uh, that if one knows oneself, and knows your enemy, you need not fear a hundred battles. Knowing your enemy and knowing yourself is just as challenging as today to the United States government as it, is, as it was to the Chinese empire that Sun Tzu uh, was, was involved in. Another statesman and military thinker, one that uh, Josh cites in uh, his epigraph, uh, Baron von Clausewitz uh, stated that, and I'm paraphrasing here, uh, the most difficult task for the statesman is to understand the kind of war upon which he is embarking and not to mistake it for something which it is not. Josh's uh, paper goes into some detail on two case studies for military assistance to in counterterrorism, counterinsurgency, Colombia and the Philippines. And one of the things that stands out uh, about the thesis that I, I particularly liked is that he, he called on academia. He's clearly researched and read uh, the papers, the books, the many uh, tomes that are out there talking about uh, military assistance to foreign governments and related topics. But he also went into some great lengths, and this is difficult as an undergraduate, uh, difficult to get access to, and difficult to even understand what's relevant and what isn't. He went to great lengths to um, look at these things through the eyes of actual operators and military professionals who were, and uh, embassy people, and State Department and Defense Department folks who were involved in them. And it definitely deepens and broadens and makes more um, relevant, I think, the, the paper itself and more credible uh, the, the conclusions to which uh, he comes. Having said that, um, I think that uh, it's like the, the operation was successful but the patient died. I personally uh, think that most of what he builds up in his data leads to a different, slightly different conclusion, slightly different. In that, yes, I agree that counterinsurgency uh, efforts done right is the most difficult aspect of military science and military operations. So many variables exist. So much can go wrong. So many different uh, factors must come into play. It is so easy to win the battle but lose the war through, uh, <clears throat> through overzealous counterterrorism techniques that I completely agree with his conclusion that this is tough. However, I think that there is no, there is simply no alternative uh, for the current uh, world situation and the current posture which the United States finds itself in. There is simply no alternative to getting it right, to devoting the resources and the expertise and the effort to find that balance, to attenuate the volume, uh, to skillfully bring about assistance that is neither too little, too much, but as with Alice, uh, or with, uh, with the, uh, 
the little girl and the three bears just right. Um, and I think in Colombia and the Philippines, there is much to be uh, there is much to be learned, much that was done that has been done right. And I think Josh alludes to quite a few of those, um, those aspects in his paper. What I'd like to do is go through some items that struck me as I read it, not the typographical error on page 47 or the um, specific you know, uh, uh, dispute or expansion of, of specific things that jo Josh wrote about, but to just talk a little bit about some current activities, things that um, come across my desk, sometimes through internal documents and cables, sometimes from reporting from the newspaper or, or CNN, but that might be of interest. And uh, hopefully this isn't too much uh, inside baseball um, for, for this audience. First of all, <clears throat> what strikes me about uh, the world and military operations, I should say U.S. government operations across the board, of which military um, uh, assistance and training and operations is one element, is that we have the reemergence of FID, the Foreign Internal Defense aspect of the special operations community. FID is the task of the so-called Vanilla SF. Vanilla SF's special forces are the guys that go out and embed themselves for weeks or months with foreign uh, uh, military units and provide training on everything from tactics to operations to medical to human rights to um, the uh, uh, identification of targets and so forth. The reason they call it vanilla is because there's a black side of the house, the dark side. These are the men in black. Direct action is one term for it. The special special forces, the Delta guys, the SEAL Team 6, the folks that are able to drop into a place unannounced, unknown, uh, kick open the door, grab the bad guy, and spirit him away if all goes well. And there were for many, for a number of years, I perceived, and this is not my direct involvement, but I perceived through people talking to folks in the community that there was a great emphasis on on that aspect of special ops, that those that was the that those were the cream of the cream of the crop, that was where people wanted to go. The regular special forces, who in their own rights are extremely uh, extremely capable and elite, were finding themselves more and more constrained from carrying out what they were trained to do uh, in a very important aspect of unconventional warfare, the doctrine of unconventional warfare. Um, that is, to engage with foreign militaries and work with them. Part of that was due to <clears throat> a lack of appreciation for the need for this. And, and part of it, I think, was due to the concern, and Josh alludes to this aspect in his, in his paper, about the potential political risks and liabilities of having something go wrong, of having American boots on the ground. When I was in Sierra Leone and Guinea uh, a few years ago, 1999 or early 2000, and the Sierra Leone conflict was, had been raging along with a terrible insurgency movement, the Revolutionary United Front, brutally uh, uh, cutting the arms off children and the population, terrorizing the population, the British stepped up, a former British colony, British went in there and put about 1,000 people on the ground to remake and professionalize the Sierra Leone military. Covering African affairs for the House International Relations Committee, I thought this was a worthwhile effort, and I thought the U.S. should help out. Happy that the British were taking the lead, but what could we do to support it? And it was like pulling teeth to get even three American military personnel to be deployed to Freetown to work with the British and assist. Sure, you can have some money, you can have some equipment, but the idea of putting actual bodies, American uh, uh, military people on the ground in Sierra Leone caused a great deal of consternation in the office of the Secretary of Defense and among senior policymakers because what if another Somalia happens? 
what if something goes wrong? These guys are killed, they're dragged through the street in front of CNN cameras, the members of Congress burst into uh, the, uh, 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 burst, burst out of a briefing room to speak to the, CNN, to the television cameras as they did after the October 3rd, 1992 uh, Black Hawk Down incident in Somalia. And the charge against the administration of the time, the executive branch, is that you guys are putting our boys, our precious soldiers in harm's way for something that is not vital to U.S. interests. It made us careful. It made us, in my opinion, too careful. I should have said at the beginning, uh, for those that haven't figured it out, that I'm speaking on my own behalf here. I've, I've cleared nothing with Secretary Rice. <laughs> and, uh, and so please take it as just my comments and observations and, and in no way uh, a reflection of U.S. Uh, policy. In fact, it's probably more a reverse barometer. But we, we, we became very cautious for something that anything that was regarded as non-vital. That has changed. That has changed dramatically since 9-11. Josh in his thesis talks a little bit about the fact that in the Philippines, we've got special forces truly embedded with Filipino units going out on patrols not in a combat posture, but armed with, as he quoted one person, with real ammunition in their guns, and accompanying them. Is there risk involved? Yes. Could something happen? Yes. But all of a sudden, since 9-11, the administration, of course, but also the Congress and the American people have come to recognize that it's worth the risk. That's, we need to be in these places. That some place that is not immediately and obviously vital to our national interest could become a haven for Al-Qaeda, Jammu Islamiya, a group that does have designs on a big, <coughs> splashy terrorist attack on Americans in our homeland or on our embassies overseas. And so I think we have become much more robust, not only in the military, uh, with military assistance and training, but also in State Department, like the kind of office that I'm involved in through diplomatic security, with our intelligence agencies, with law enforcement assistants and, um, and uh, advisors, of actually being willing to put people potentially in harm's way. Now, why is that significant? First of all, <clears throat> training at the tactical level, you know, a, a, a special forces uh, uh, A team of 12, 12 men can train up a battalion of foreign forces quite well in tactics, shoot, move, communicate, night operations, medical. They really do a fantastic job. That's only part of the challenge. The rest of the challenge is getting this battalion to operate as trained and as equipped independently in a capable manner. There is a factor of stiffening, a stiffening agent that happens when you put instructors that have built a relationship of trust with the people they have instructed, that are not only experts and viewed as, cap as competent and capable, but have also shared the same meals, slept in the same place, spoken the same language, if, if, if at all possible, uh, and bonded with the folks that they're working with, and then take the next step and say, OK, you've got a patrol tonight. We're coming along. As opposed to saying, we'll train you but then you're on your own because we're not allowed to go out with you. There's another reason for um, value in having our people, whether they be serving military officers, contractors uh, brought in through a program like ours, to be on the ground with these folks, 
but especially for the military. And that is uh, what the military sometimes terms exploration uh, of the battle space. In a mid-level type threat, say a place like the Philippines, where Abu Sayyaf organization is active, it does take hostages, it does kill people, it does blow up pipelines, but it's not, as Josh points out, at the level of an al-Qaeda. There is no information that Abu Sayyaf is planning to ship over you know, chemical weapons and try to blow them up in uh, you know, New York's harbor. But what if? What if the Philippines in that southern Mindanao area, some of the denied areas, becomes a haven for the al Qaeda. What if Abu Sayyaf organization evolves into that kind of uh, jihadist Islamist movement that wants to wage war on the great Satan, uh, America, for whatever reason? Do, if it rises to the level of an immediate and, and direct threat to US interests, you can be sure that the US will want to get in there with the agreement of the Filipino government to take care of business, to do it ourselves if, if need be. Should we be going in there cold? Or should we be going into a situation because by virtue of our training and assistance over the previous years, we have direct familiarity? I was recently in Kenya where Diplomatic Security's Anti-Terrorism Assistance Program is putting together a a robust in-country training and assistance program to Kenyan National Police, uh, Kenya's Counterterrorism Center, immigration officials, Kenya Revenue Authority folks, a range of Kenyan agencies. And a big focus of it is creating and training them on the operation of a joint terrorism task force, getting agencies to cooperate, something that we've learned is necessary, learned it the hard way with our own interagency rivalries, and, and we're still in the process of, of sorting that, self, that out among ourselves. But it's, mu it's much worse in most foreign environments, whether Colombia, Kenya, the Philippines, Indonesia. Interagency rivalries, turf battles, and so forth can really be debilitating. But in Kenya, we have a, we, we did a, uh, uh, um, I did a trip up to Lamu on the coast. Part of our effort will be a maritime interdiction operation to assist the Kenyan police in setting up uh, some capability to patrol the inshore waters, which are very shallow, in which a lot of dows, traditional boats, ply uh, their trade from Somalia down into Kenya. Most of it legitimate, but some of it smuggling, contraband of various kinds, and possibly arms, explosives, both coming into Kenya and sometimes as an exit route for bad guys who have done, who have been involved in terrorist activity in Kenya. We want the Kenyans to be able to patrol that. The US Navy, as part of the Horn of Africa effort uh, based out of Djibouti, is present up there. They're working with the Kenyan Navy. And what I discovered when I went over there and sat down at the embassy in the country team meeting with representatives of the Navy who were, uh, who were uh, present there, is that in the process of their work with the Kenyan Navy, going up and down that coast with their 11 meter rigid inflatable boats and training the Navy uh, people on maritime interdiction, guess what? They'd been plugging in waypoints in their GPS. They'd been looking at the harbors. They'd been identifying boat ramps. They'd been identifying fuel sources. They've been keeping their eyes open. That's preparation of the battle space. That's what I'm talking about. If all of a sudden there was a threat in Kenya that was way bigger than what the Kenyan authorities could do, and the US said, we, will, we really want to come in there and help. We want to get those guys. The Kenyans would probably say, yes, we understand. Please do. We wouldn't be going in there cold. We'd know a little bit about that area. So I just wanted to underline that as one aspect of military training and assistance. Now where it gets a little bit tricky, and this is what I meant by inside baseball, is congressional authorities 
you know, the pendulum swings. Right now, we're in a period, particularly immediately after 9-11, but still to this day, we're in a period where we're saying, hey, we got to be out there. We got to be doing things. We got to be engaged. All it takes is, you know, a series of, of abuses of some kind, a series of mistakes, a series of, um, of actions that actually clearly incite greater antipathy to the United States or terrorism, the pendulum could swing back the other way. And that's what it's done throughout you know, our, our, our history. We have some conflicting congressional authorities and restraints. Title 10 authority allows special operations forces to go into places in which training can be an element of it, but it's for their own special operations authority pur and purposes. The traditional form of military assistance, what, what, what Josh refers to in most of his, his, uh, his, his thesis, the conventional military assistance of, uh, of providing frigates and uh, uh, used uh, armor and that, those kinds of things to foreign militaries is Title 22. We have under the Diplomatic Security uh, Authority under a different piece of legislation, under the Foreign Assistance Act, that gives us authority to do training and in, in, uh, counterterrorism assistance to law enforcement. So there are all these different kinds of authorities, and sometimes they don't quite fit with what the situation on the ground calls for. Part of the challenge of knowing your enemy, knowing yourself, knowing yourself is to understand that we may not have exactly the right congressional or, or legal authority to do something exactly the way we would do it if completely under, unconstrained. That doesn't mean it doesn't, that the restraint doesn't exist. We need to work within it and if necessary, go back to Congress, explain these are not stupid people, they're just politicians. They just need to be, sometimes you need to explain why an amendment needs to be put in place. And this takes time. And this is what is frustrating for folks in the field. On the positive side, folks in the field are incredibly creative. And when you get a situation like a Colombia or a Philippines or an Indonesia or even to some extent a Kenya, where you have an engaged and active country team trying to get something done, they work out things. And government performs in which the way, in the way that we as taxpayers would hope it would, where we're not duplicating activities but actually combining resources. It happens more effectively in the field and it addresses some of what, what Josh is recommending, that we look at the full range, economic, diplomatic, military, information, cultural, the whole range of instruments at our disposal to carefully calibrate our approach. Headquarters, rivalries, budget competition, and so forth can put a monkey wrench in that. But I think to the extent that we have a clear vision of what we're trying to do in a specific area, and we keep pushing out that decision-making authority out into the field where folks can take the local conditions into account, we will have better and better programs. There is a continuum between training others and doing it yourself. One of the points that John, Josh makes that I think is very valid is, is what I alluded to earlier. You can put in the training, the tactical training, you can put in the, the equipment, but are they really going to be able to perform? And if they can't perform, have you just wasted uh, uh, your, your efforts? as opposed to going in and doing it yourself. Okay, step aside Kenya, step aside Philippines, the 10th Mountain Division, the Rangers, the, uh, the SEALs are coming in, we're gonna take care of business. That has other problems, externalities come. There is a continuum and that continuum, the, the, the place where we are on that continuum can be adjusted depending on the threat that we perceive. Let me uh, just make one final point that was kept coming up in the back of my mind as I was reading this, this uh, paper, which, which, which is very, a very recent event that wouldn't, uh, but would have, had it been present, uh, Josh, Josh no doubt would have uh, talked about it a bit. Um, 
In Iraq, we have a sui generis situation in which U.S. military under CENTCOM have the authority to train all of these security forces in Iraq, military all the way through civilian. U.S. military in Iraq are in control of training and assistance for the police as well as the army. Now that is not the way we usually do things, but it's justified given the circumstances in Iraq. It appears that DOD has liked the taste of that bite of the apple because in the draft DOD authorization that is currently going to go up before Congress, there's language that would uh, enable U.S. military to more easily do that in other countries. And the State Department is pushing back, or I suspect the State Department will push back. They're, they're gathering input from the various bureaus and so forth. And the bureau's response is, hey, wait a minute. That's something that should be very, very exceptional. We don't want to go that far. But I can understand where it's coming from. The Department of Defense, the guys on the ground find it cumbersome to have to keep coming back to State Department or other authorities when they see the security continuum between military and police as gray. Our government will, will sort it out, but I suspect that this is an example where the checks and balances that are inherent in our system will reach some, some medium that will, uh, that will make sense until the pendulum swings again. Let me close by saying that um, that my father used to say when I would uh, send him a paper that he probably didn't read, <laughs> but you know, looked at the grade. I, I remember he, he blanched a bit at it when I sent him a 20-page paper on Claude Levi-Strauss and, the, uh, uh, and the, uh, uh, some pretty deep and arcane stuff that I was working on when I was here. But he, would, uh, he was proud of me uh, being here at Dartmouth where he went uh, he was in the Marine Corps and uh, only never would have gone to college except for the, uh, the Navy program that put people in, into college after the World War II. But he used to say, it'll be interesting to see where you go. Sometimes he would also say that after I'd do, done something particularly stupid. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but that's the way I feel about Josh. It'll be interesting to see where he goes. And I would like to ask him to consider uh, a sequel to this worthy effort. In about 20 years, I would like him to revisit the question and see what he comes up with after 20 years of a no doubt very interesting and varied career in the, both the policy making, the analysis, and the operational side of things, and see where he comes out. So. Let's all get back together here in the Dickey Center 20 years from now. Thank you. Thanks very much, Tom. As a former vanilla soldier, it's always nice to know how people in the State Department refer to us. <laughs> I just wanted to actually re-emphasize one of the things that Tom said, because it really struck me listening to his remarks. He talked about this pendulum swinging back and forth in terms of the, the United States, the nature of the United States engagement in the rest of the world. I served for 15 years, first as a Special Forces communication soldier and then as an armor officer, and I never once deployed on a combat operation. Today, that would be inconceivable. Um, it would just be, I mean, it would be, it's impossible to imagine. I talk to friends that are in similar situations today, and they're like, you didn't go anywhere? I said, well, I saw I went to Georgia, <laughs> Alabama, <and> Louisiana. <laughs> well, we did go to Canada once. <clears throat> they can't imagine it. And so I, I, I wonder about what the events will be that lead the pendulum to swing back as it always does. Our last and far from least speaker today is Paul Pilar. Paul Pilar is the United States National Intelligence Officer for Near East and South Asia. Again, perhaps most importantly, he received his BA, summa cum laude, from Dartmouth College. He also received a bachelor's in philosophy from Oxford University and a master's in PhD from our illustrious neighbor to the south, Princeton University. 
Mr. Pillar was appointed National Intelligence Officer in October, October 2000 upon returning to the intelligence community from the Brookings Institution, where he was a federal executive fellow. He joined the Central Intelligence Agency in 1977 and has served in a variety of analytic and managerial positions in the intelligence community, including serving as chief of analytic units covering portions of the Near East, the Persian Gulf, and South Asia. He previously served in the National Intelligence Council as one of the original members of its analytic group. He has been executive assistant to the CIA's deputy director for intelligence and executive assistant to the director of central intelligence at the time, William Webster. He headed the assessments and information group of the DCI's counterterrorist center and from 1997 to 1999 was the deputy chief of that center. Mr. Pillar is a retired United States Army officer. He served on active duty from 1971 to 1973, including a tour of duty in Vietnam. I came to know Mr. Pillar as an undergraduate at Cornell University when I read his outstanding book, Negotiating Peace. It was published by Princeton University Press. More recently, he's published with Brookings Press, Terrorism and United States Foreign Policy. Please welcome Mr. Paul Pillar. Thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, I'm, I'm really pleased to be here, uh, not just to participate in this uh, event with an outstanding piece of work as the basis for discussion, but a couple of other uh, connections that hark back to my undergraduate years. Uh, Tom was referring to uh, one uh, late former president of this college. When I was an undergraduate, John Sloan Dickey was still the president. Uh, it was the last few years of what I think turned out to be about a quarter century tenure as president of this institution. He's the one who gave me my matriculation certificate and all the rest. So it's kind of nice to, uh, kind of neat to be in an event sponsored here in the center that's named after him. And then the other thing is a connection with the Chase Peace Prize, um, not included in that uh, bio because I don't stick it in myself. Um, 39 years ago, uh, when I was a freshman, uh, I had the privilege and honor to win the other part of the uh, Chase Peace Prize that Chris mentioned, the, the undergraduate essay contest. So let that serve as, a, as an encouragement to Chris's advertisement for any of you uh, undergraduates who are thinking of entering. Anybody can do it. <laughs> and, um, and Josh, you, know, you were talking about a 30 or 40 year time frame for you know, being invited back. Well, that, that's, that was the time frame that worked for me. You know, <laughs> not not uh, you know, a few months like you. Um, I, I certainly, like Tom, I'm not uh, speaking in any official capacity, not only that, but uh, really my comments have absolutely nothing to do with my, my day job. I'm just uh, going to offer a few quick observations as an old counter-terrorist hand. Um, you know, Josh's thesis does an outstanding job of, of laying out the, the pros, the cons, the strengths, the weaknesses, the overt and not so obvious considerations that uh, go into this one particular instrument of U.S. policy as it relates to counterterrorism or counterinsurgency operations, namely military assistance. But most of what went through my mind as an old counterterrorist hand when I was reading uh, this excellent thesis was how well it um, illustrates and points out a number of principles or points that really apply to counterterrorism generally, not just to military assistance. And some of this Josh really uh, stated explicitly in his own remarks, but what I'd like to do is just, just kind of as a sort of riff on what he said, uh, point out some of these things that really go beyond just the military assistance sorts of things. And, and, and the one, the, the, the first principle or point is that counterterrorism is not primarily and certainly not exclusively a military effort. Uh, and, the, and the main reason for that, as Josh indeed points out in his thesis, is that most of the terrorist planning preparations that really matter to us, the sorts of things that the 9-11 plotters were doing before they committed their act, <laughs> don't occur in places or at facilities that offer good military targets. They take place behind closed apartment doors in places like Kuala Lumpur or Hamburg or in flight schools in Florida and other places where U.S. Special Forces or military forces or anybody's military forces aren't very useful with regard to uh, uh, putting a crimp in their activities. Nonetheless, you know, we, we Americans seem to, to think of this counterterrorism thing in war terms um, and in military terms. And I think there are a number of reasons for that. One, you know, military 
means are one of the tools, one of the dimensions on which we have one of the biggest advantages over everyone else. So it's a, perhaps a source of comfort and, and uh, at least strategic comfort uh, in thinking about it uh, to phrase things and think of things primarily in military terms. Another reason I fear is that sometimes other efforts, which are military, and that may go under the name of counterterrorism, but really are more about other things, tend to get conflated with the strictly counterterrorist effort. So we, we, we think of that all as a, a war. But I, perhaps one of the more basic reasons is how we historically have tended to think about uh, foreign policy in this country. And here I'm going to uh, borrow some concepts from uh, Walter Russell Mead, uh, as he's enunciated them in his, his book, Special Provenance. Um, and be, but before I do that, let, let, me, let me say anything critical I'm implying here that doesn't apply just to the current administration or any, any one administration or any one party. And let me, um, let, let, me, let me show you how that's true by referring to that, bug, that book that uh, uh, Josh was so nice to plug so generously, as well as, uh, as you, Ellen, uh, which, which was on counterterrorism, and, and it came out just a few months before 9-11. And in the very first paragraph of, of that book that I wrote, uh, it refers to the fact that, uh, or it asserts anyway, that um, counterterrorism was a major U.S. public policy concern, and in fact it was often thought of or referred to as a war. Now, don't most of you think, you know, the war on terrorism started in September of 2001? How soon we forget. We were actually using that term, albeit without the ubiquity that we hear it these days back before 9-11. But going back to Mead, uh, he talks about uh, you know, one, of, one of the big traditions in U.S. foreign policy thinking is what he calls the Jacksonian tradition, named after Andrew Jackson, which is the most militant and populist of the traditions. And I would uh, posit that much of our thinking about what we've come to call the war on terrorism is an outstanding illustration of the Jacksonian tradition. In fact, even though Mead wrote his book also before, it came out shortly before, uh, the events of September uh, 2001, much of what he describes is an excellent description of our popular American reaction. And, and what the Jacksonian tradition, one of, part of what it, it, it says when, or what it's all about when, when the American people are confronted with what they see as a serious threat to their security is, we get militant. We wage war against whatever the threat is. We turn on a switch and we go from peace to war. And as Meade puts it, it's an on-off switch. We're either in peacetime or we're in wartime. We don't like to think of things in terms of a dimmer switch as far as national security strategy is concerned. And so we think that we have a war on terrorism that started all at once with one event three and a half years ago, and that we weren't actually doing an awful lot with regard to counterterrorism before that. Well, I'm not going to go off on a tangent about other things that I think are, are perhaps shortcomings of of this way that we Americans tend to think of, of war and peace. But it does have to do with this overall point of why do we think of counterterrorism mainly in military terms. And I think much of the discourse about what we know of, know of as the war on terrorism in this country, and, and I, I apply this criticism to both critics and supporters of the current administration as well as those who would consider themselves to be neither critics nor supporters. A lot of what you hear fails to distinguish at the outset whether a reference to the war on terrorism is to a metaphorical war, meaning simply a major national effort to, um, to confront some threat or problem akin to the war on drugs or war on poverty, or if it refers to literal warfare, meaning application of military force, use of military forces, and everything that goes along with it, including, amongst other things, the laws of war. Uh, I've seen the failure even amongst uh, scholars in uh, academic publications to distinguish among the use of the concept of war in their writing as applying to a way of defining the problem of terrorism, a way of assessing the seriousness of the problem, and as a way of confronting the problem. Those are three different things, but too often they get kind of all mushed together, and I would suggest that's perhaps one of the biggest reasons why counterterrorism, perhaps inappropriately, uh, comes to be thought of primarily as a military effort when it's really a lot more things as well. 
Second basic point, which flows from the first, and really Josh has, has covered this quite well in the last part of his remarks, so I'm just going to mention it briefly, is that counterterrorism requires the use of several different tools, intelligence, law enforcement, financial controls, and many other things, diplomacy, as well as the military force that is the main subject of Josh's thesis. Uh, a couple of just subpoints, though, about this, about having to use a panoply of tools. One is you actually have to use them together. It's not just in parallel, it's together. Now, I, I know most about the intelligence tool, and I'm having to continually remind people that the main contributions of intelligence to counterterrorism aren't what we tend to think of most often, and that is finding that nugget of information about the next big terrorist plot and rolling it up. You know, intelligence does it all. No, the main things intelligence do are to support all those other instruments, including the military ones, and the law enforcement ones, and the financial controls, and the diplomacy. Supporting offices like Tom's and the Office of the uh, Counterterrorism and Coordinator in the State Department, supporting U.S. military forces, supporting what those Filipinos and Colombians are doing uh, in their particular efforts. But, uh, you know, we usually don't hear about that. Um, also, you know, each, each one of these tools and instruments has weaknesses as well as strengths. Josh has exhaustively and very skillfully analyzed those with regard to military assistance, but it applies to all <laughs> the other ones as well. And, and he's pointed out, very useful, I think, in his, in his thesis, I don't believe he mentioned it in his oral remarks, one of the reasons why you have to kind of look not just at one tool but several, and that is that the terrorists themselves are adaptive. They're protean. They, they change their approach. Clamp down on them militarily and they'll do something else. Clamp down on them financially and they'll find some way, way around your clamping. I give you another example besides his Colombian and Filipino ones. Uh, the Algerian a struggle for independence in 1954 to 1962. It was a guerrilla war, not too unlike the two case studies in his thesis. And the French won the guerrilla war. They won the military effort. So what did the FLN, the, the uh, Algerian resistance group, do? They went more to an urban terrorist campaign. And in a sense, they didn't win that tactically either, but they certainly won with regard to French patience and French opinion. And so Charles de Gaulle in 1962 granted them their independence. A third all overall principle and point that I think Josh's thesis uh, points out very well with regard to military assistance, but actually is applicable more generally, is that every case, and by case I mean every terrorist group, every state, every particular terrorist problem is different. And you have to, in essence, tailor a policy to meet each one individually. Now, Josh was very careful in selecting his particular cases, the Filipino problem with regard to the Abu Sayyaf group in the South and, um, and the Columbia FARC problem, and noted that those in many ways were the most promising cases for use of military assistance. So he was able to make some generalizations about, well, if, if we saw the limitations and the problems there, then we can't really expect to do much better elsewhere. But he's also careful to point out that essentially the point I'm making, as it applies more generally to counterterrorism, no two cases are the same. And let me just touch on a couple of other issues he raises and expand on them a bit. One is the question of Afghanistan and what does that prove and what does it disprove in terms of what you can and cannot do militarily. And we're referring here to Operation Enduring Freedom, the U.S. military in intervention in Afghanistan, which succeeded in overthrowing the Taliban. Uh, beginning in the fall of 2001. And I would just point out that Afghanistan is a unique case. There is no other case that has come close to it where you had this really odious uh, medieval Islamist regime, the Taliban, in a close partnership ideologically and materially with Osama bin Laden and his al-Qaeda group. There's been nothing else like that. Uh, that really duplicates that elsewhere. And so the U.S. intervention into an ongoing Afghan civil war, Operation Enduring Freedom, I think you can argue is, was, number one, both a successful and important use of the military instrument. I would say the most successful and important use of the military instrument on behalf of counterterrorism. And still one that need not give us uh, you know, a lot of, well, a lot of hope, I'm sorry to say, for you know, similar uses of military force elsewhere because Afghanistan was so un unique. Another issue Josh raises is, is the so-called decapitation strategy, you know, going after a, a leader of a group as a way of, of trying to weaken it quickly, a leader or the top leaders. And here again, 
How well that strategy works is going to depend a lot on the particular group you're talking about. Let me give you some examples on one side and on the other. Sendero Luminoso, really vicious uh, uh, radical group that came close to just absolutely destroying the state of Peru. One of the key blows against Sendero Luminoso was the capture of its founder and leader, Abimeo Guzman. Guzman then underwent kind of a jailhouse conversion. His followers got real confused, and it was downhill from there. Sendero's still around, but not nearly the threat it was several years ago. Similar example, uh, the Kurdistan Workers' Party, which has changed its name a couple of times since then. I still call it that, the so-called PKK. Uh, when their leader was captured, Abdullah Ocalan, same sort of thing. He had a jailhouse conversion. He tells his leaders, no, let's stop the fight. He uh, tells his followers that. His followers get confused. The PKK, or Congre Jail, as it calls itself these days, is now nowhere near the threat it was when it was waging a major insurgency and terrorist offensive back in the 1980s, resulting in something like 30,000 deaths in Turkey alone. But a contrary example, take, take Hamas, the Palestinian organization. And of course, the Israelis have placed uh, considerable emphasis on decapitation there. We had uh, one, one streak just uh, you know, a couple of months back when we had assassinated within three or four weeks of each other Sheikh Yassin, the uh, cleric who was one of the founders of Hamas, and then basically his successor, Dr. Rantizi, both bumped off in, in the space of uh, a month or two. Hamas is still a vigorous and in many ways threatening organization, both with regard to terrorist operations and military capabilities, and by the way, just the other day, they won 70% of the seats in municipal elections in the Gaza Strip. Decapitation isn't working anywhere nearly as well with Hamas as it did with Sendero Luminoso and the PKK. Fourth point is uh, we need to integrate counterterrorism with broader foreign policy. And here I think, uh, again, with regard to military assistance, Josh has done an excellent job of this, particularly in, in uh, expanding on the point uh, as, a, as a hazard here, as a pitfall of, uh, of military assistance in some places. Um, of being seen, the United States being seen to be in bed with and a supporter of regimes that have their own popularity problem with their own populations. And once again, as he pointed out in his thesis, actually the uh, Filipino and Colombia cases are ones where that problem is relatively less. There are other instances in which um, uh, it perhaps could be greater. Ones where we haven't expended the military assistance to the degree that we have in those two instances but, and here's, here's where I'm generalizing the point, it's not just military assistance that runs this hazard, it's other counter-terrorist tools, indeed it's other foreign policy tools that cause foreign populations to look at what kind of relationship we have with, another, with their, own, their government, a government that they, they, their own people, for various reasons, may not like, because it is authoritarian, because it's a violation of human rights, because it doesn't respect minority rights, or what have you, and we, suffer from a kind of guilt by association. And it could have terrorist consequences in exactly the way that Josh described. But again, it goes far beyond military assistance. It's really a matter of broader foreign policy. And finally, my, my last uh, kind of observation, and again, one that uh, Josh has applied to this topic, but I would generalize, is that we need to lower our sights as to exactly what we can accomplish using any of these tools. Josh has pointed out the limitations with regard to military assistance, and, and uh, he's argued that, uh, look, we're, our expectations have tended to be rather high as to what even uh, well-assisted forces in a place like Colombia or the Philippines can do when what we're ex expecting them to do sometimes is very difficult or even impossible for the best trained, most elite U.S. forces to do. But again, it's, it's true of all those, those other tools. Um, we have to remember that terrorism is a tactic, a technique that can be used on behalf of any cause. And there's going to be no shortage of causes and no shortages of grievances for as far as I can see uh, in whose behalf one group or another is going to use the terrorist tactic. There will also be no shortage of vulnerabilities uh, that, the ter that the terrorists, seeing terrorism as one of the quintessential weapons of the weak against the strong, will continue to take advantage of. So finally, uh, again, Josh, uh, thank you for the uh, occasion and opportunity to come back to the Hanover Plain for me to do that. And once again, congratulations on an outstanding piece of work.
Well, first off, I'd like to thank uh, all of our panelists for what I found to be tremendously illuminating remarks. We have about 10 minutes remaining for questions, and so I'll simply turn the floor over. I'll recognize whoever has a question. I just uh, remind all present to have a question rather than a statement. on this and I think uh, Paul may if he disagrees I'd go with Paul uh, <laughs> when this goes back to what a couple of us have said about customizing your approach and every case being different there is there are tremendous signs of progress in the assistance, the, the operation of Iraqi security forces, both military and police, particularly military. And the proof is in how they behaved last April uh, in the first effort in Fallujah, where many, many of the troops of the National Defense Forces the regular army and the police cut and ran almost immediately when faced with uh, insurgent um, activity compared to in recent months where Iraqi forces have not only stood their ground but in many cases died or suffered grievous wounds in firefights and operations against insurgents. And I would attribute that change to a couple of things. Number one, notwithstanding what I said earlier about um, State Department's questioning of uh, broad authority for DOD, Defense Department, to train police in other countries, I personally think that in Iraq it was absolutely essential and uh, a critically important decision for the President to issue last March or April or May a presidential decision directive that put all training and assistance to Iraqi security forces under the multinational coalition uh, and in specifically uh, the U.S. participant in that CENTCOM. What we had been doing up to that point through State Department um, INL Bureau, the International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Bureau, was a well-funded effort to provide civilian police training and assistance using largely the Kosovo model of putting police through basic training uh, and then embedding uh, international police advisors with, uh, with the police at their units to continue on the job advice and training. It wasn't working because Iraq was not Kosovo. We had all kinds of international police advisors standing by ready to deploy but the security situation simply would not allow it. And eight weeks of basic training for Iraqis, uh, Iraqi police was just not going to, to cut it without that continued ongoing president presence, that stiffening agent. We had no mechanism for taking a bunch of civilians operating under contracts, you know, former sheriff's deputies from North Carolina, some of them, you know, former police folks, folks who had skills to offer and capabilities, but we had no mechanism for putting them out in harm's way and expecting them to either survive or prosper in that environment. What the military has been able to do, foremost with their, the military units in the Iraqi National Defense Forces, but to a, an extent also with, with special units of the police, 
is because of the military present presence because of their force protection resources and structure they have been able to get in get embedded with the units and the tr the continuum from training and instruction and equipping to actual operations is is fairly seamless there's an aspect of this that is worth underlining, underscoring, and that is a cultural aspect. You all are very politely sitting here and listening to us even though we haven't met before. We don't have a personal relationship, but you've been told that Paul and I have you know, certain experience and expertise and competencies, which makes it worth your while to sit here and listen to us. The Iraqi uh, culture and mindset is, is, is quite different. Um, just having a special forces guy with all kinds of credentials stand up and say, I'm gonna train you now in this and you're gonna listen to me and then you're gonna follow the instructions that we've trained you on, doesn't cut it. There's no relationship there. But once the troops were embedded and started operating with these Iraqi units, a relationship developed. They became colleagues, they became compatriots. At that point, the Iraqis would listen, almost in the sense of humoring their friends to follow some of the practices. The practices are good. Things like increasing the role and responsibility and leadership capabilities of non-commissioned officers, pushing down decision making, building up skill levels, building bonds between people, making it more predictable if you're going through a doorway, who's going to do what. So after experiencing the training and doing it with an open mind because of that relationship, it, it snowballed, and the Iraqi forces, for the most part, found it useful. They liked the successes that they were getting on the board because of that training, and they continued to follow it. But it's a chick, it's, it's not a, you, you cannot do one without the other. You've got to have that presence there. You've got to build that relationship and follow it and, and sustain it. And that's what I think accounts mainly for the difference in the success. Um, but I would put it as an example of know your enemy, know yourself. Know, understand the cultural factors that are involved. Understand who you're working with, what motivates them, what drives them, what are the X factors that could undermine your, your, your efforts. And again, that takes time. It takes putting people on the ground. It takes putting people in, in putting people out there in danger. And in cases that are less obviously of paramount, of less obvious importance to US vital interests and national security, we often don't give it the time and the resources to, to do that. Thanks, Tom. Afghanistan, there's, there's no question there's still a lot of fr fragility there. There has been ever since the, the so-called bond process, which is the process of political and economic reconstruction that began in late 2001 uh, since it started. Um, but I, I, I will admit that uh, more positive has been accomplished in Afghanistan than I, I dared hope for at the time of the start of the bond process. And an awful lot of credit does have to go to President Karzai. Um, who I think has skillfully uh, navigated through uh, innumerable minefields, a lot of credit goes to the outside support, which includes the United States um, in, in various forms and uh, through very skillful diplomats like uh, Zal Khalilzad and James Dobbins, who was involved in the original Bond Conference. And I might add the constructive efforts of the Iranians, who worked very closely, as Ambassador Dobbins would tell you, uh, with, with <coughs> us and with other outsiders to make this all happen. 
Um, yes, there are still hazards. Uh, yes, there are still, there are still uh, elements of the Taliban who make parts of the southern and eastern parts of that country um, uh, a security problem. There are a few others, you know, Gulbuddin Hekmatyar's elements that are smaller in number and some Al-Qaeda types as well. But the progress has been very impressive. Um, and uh, so it's, yes, it's fragile. Yes, we are in, or we and Karzai are still in danger of losing it. But given what's been accomplished over the last uh, uh, basically three and a half years, uh, we all ought to be very encouraged by Afghanistan. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Mike? Um, you talked about creating um, sustainable counterterrorism operations in these other countries. And with regard to the military, we have a variety of, of capabilities that we have. In particular, when you're talking about the special forces, there was the Manila and the sort of black. So we have, what, we have SEAL Team 6 and Naval DevOps. We have Army, Detachment Delta, et cetera. My question is, are we training foreign militaries to have the same capabilities? In other words, are we training them <clears throat> to perform black ops as well as sort of conventional warfare tactics? Uh, what are the utilities of doing so? And what are potential problems you see with providing the full range of military counterterrorism capabilities? The, uh there was an article in the San Francisco Chronicle a few days ago that highlights one of the problems that you run into when you train train groups, um, and it was about uh, the Palestinian um, uh, authority uh, forces that um, that we did uh, training for a few few years ago. Some of whom are involved in terrorist activity, um, using those skills in effect against our policy. My take on that particular kind of issue is, um, is don't overreact from a policy standpoint. Think about your, um, none of you young folks have retirement accounts yet, but we old guys think about you know, putting money away um, for a rainy day. We don't put it in a, uh, just a savings account with a low interest rate, and we certainly don't put it in a single stock which if it crashed, we'd be out of our entire savings. Um, conserv conservative investors like, like me and many of my compatriots uh, at my age put it into an index fund or a mutual fund, uh, one that um, doesn't matter that much. If an individual stock goes down, the overall thing is to go up. I, like, I use that analogy for um, situations where we find out that somebody we trained, whether through an IMET program in the military or a or a, a DSATA program uh, turns out to be a bad one, you know, either corrupt as heck or, uh, or actually even worse, you know, engaging in terrorism activities and using those bomb, you know, you, you can't train someone how to defuse a bomb <coughs> without training them how to make one. Um, when somebody goes bad, you know, I say, don't be callous about it. Do everything you can to constantly improve your vetting procedures, but uh, understand that it's going to happen. The surest way to make sure that we never train anybody who's ever going to be bad would be to restrict our programs to places like Costa Rica and Sweden. <laughs> but the problem is that's not where the bad guys are. You know, you got to get out there and mix it up. Now, the other part of your question was, um, um, you know, do we? Um, I'm sorry, was it about the, the 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 difference between the seals and the you know, the dev group versus the the vanilla? No. It was the utility of training foreign military forces to have oh, all of those. Oh, up, up, up the full range. Again, I would say it depends. And, and the answer is yes, we are. You know, we are in certain circumstances um, doing, I think, some pretty, pretty significant uh, uh, skills level training. But in those circumstances, um, the agencies that are doing that are also taking extraordinary measures. I mean, to use an example from Colombia, there's a counter drug unit um, that the U.S. works with closely that is not just vetted for human rights abuses like we do for, for everyone we train under Leahy Amendment provisions, but also that undergo by, by agreement, by their own agreement, polygraph tests, urinalysis, you know, so that we can be absolutely sure that these vetted units 
our folks who aren't going to go bad on us and and and, uh, and um, both embarrass us and, and undercut the mission. But that's very those kinds of programs are very intense and they're limited to places of, of high national interest where you know the the decision is made to to expend that kind of effort. Well, on that upbeat note. <laughs> I'd like to thank all of you for coming, and I look forward to seeing you again in 30 years. Thanks very much.